All right, everybody, welcome to the space. Um, just waiting for our co-host Anatoly, and I see he's turned up there. Uh, all right, guys, let's kick this off. Anatoly, welcome to the space. Let's talk about the fact that the world is about to end within the next decade and a half, and we're all going to die and get turned into paper clips. What's your take on this? Uh, hello, Anatoly, can you hear me? He may be having some audio issues. Oh, okay, yeah, I turned on the mic. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Uh, should I give you the short version or get straight to the long version? Let's let's go with the short version. Uh, okay, basically, um, I'm familiar with the arguments that uh, uh, AGI, super machine super intelligent, is the last invention man need ever make, blah de blah de blah I mean, yeah, those are all valid, valid, very valid, and indeed existential concerns. Uh, the problem is that um, there's uh, there's no there's no way uh, alignment is really hard and actually probably impossible. There's some interesting work showing that um, uh, Shane Legs, for instance, dissertation that it's just unrealistic to um, um, to model the behavior of an, of a of a powerful uh, AI algorithm beyond some point without actually running it. Uh, the uh, game theory of the, the corporate politics, uh, the geopolitics of, uh, of AI control is also likewise totally unrealistic. I mean, those are just the banal realities. Uh, but uh, I'm not pessimistic about that, uh, like Yudkowsky, because I, d I do think that many of the uh, central assumptions are significantly um, uh, well flawed. I mean, intelligence is a network. Uh, people... Uh, uh, you only like have get get like the capacity to solve complex problems when you're in a big network like uh, like in a new sphere. Uh, the uh, any AI will be bounded by basic dives, uh, which probably would probably rule out uh, like extremely narrow ideological predilections, such as turning everything into paper clips. Uh, even if that did happen, uh, then there would probably be other intelligent agents, uh, uh, including machine intelligences and uh, agents that the uh, the bad AGI itself creates that would be rather opposed to such a course of action, simply because it wouldn't be entirely uh, great for their own health. And I also think that there's uh, some uh, things uh, related to uh, aspects of philosophy, such as the doomsday, doomsday argument and Boston's ideas uh, that uh, sort of uh, make a, uh, a, an AGI apocalypse uh, along those lines quite quite implausible. But we can discuss that, uh, that in time. Okay, so your take is that alignment is probably not possible, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and the, the reasons for this are, you know, something from Shane Legg's dissertation about complexity theory and the geopolitical issue of different nations wanting to compete to build an AI as quickly as possible. And so the one who, you know, takes the least time to align it is going to win. So kind of just the game theory of that race means that it's not rational for either player to spend much effort on alignment, so it's probably not going to work. Is is that basically the, the two reasons? Uh, yes, basically. I mean, they're, they're separate reasons. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a mathematician myself or, or a computer scientist, so I mean, I've only got the layman's understanding of, uh, of the arguments, but uh, the basic thesis is that there's an upper bound on how powerful an algorithm can be before it can no longer be proven to be a powerful algorithm. Uh, so um, I, it's basically a black box beyond, beyond that point. Uh, you just have to flip a coin and hope it turns out well. Uh, but uh, yeah, now the second point is that co coordinating internationally across different companies and across different uh, nations uh, to uh, to uh, um, spend time and resources on AI control as opposed to actually developing the thing. Uh, I mean, the first nation to develop an AGI will uh, likely become quite super con competitive versus versus uh, other countries in relative terms. Uh, so it's quite a tall order to expect them to like uh, go listen take. Uh, um, big yud seriously um, and uh, I mean that that's that's just the reality of it and the other thing I would also point out and I think that it's a very important thing is that actually if um, 
uh, if, the, this, if the data actors who spend time on serious AI control while others do not, uh, then uh, they could, this could actually have some sort of uh, like perverse effects in the sense that um, uh, those ones which are like selected to be more responsible in the first place by, by actually doing the AI control things, uh, they will artificially hobble the power of, of the AGIs that they de actually develop. So, one, so if one of the more reckless players who do develop AI uh, and their AI ends up going uh, rogue in a big way, uh, then uh, the uh, sort of like more responsible, uh, sort of like more responsibly developed AIs are not uh, are going to be relatively hobbled and uh, uh, less capable of actually doing something about the um, uh, like the rogue Agent Smith type of type of AI, uh, which I think was is actually like actually Gwen mentions it in his uh, short sci-fi story clip here. Um, Right, but I'm just not really that convinced that alignment is not going to get done. Um, so, or at least it, that it's not going to get done because of these international game theory things. So, most likely, you know, we're in a situation where there are going to be like two or three plays. It's going to be America, China, and maybe Russia, if Putin can, you know, realize, like, like, Putin, when he realizes that, you know, AGI is going to just change the world in the next 15 years, he's going to realize what a stupid idea the Ukraine war was. And he just should have done fucking anything to just not participate in that war and just completely focus the efforts of the Russian state on building up its AGI capabilities. But never mind. Let's suppose that, you know, we get two or three actors, we get at least China and the US and then maybe some others, right? So the number of actors that are going to be able to um really participate in the uh, ai arms race is going to be small right and because it's small um it's actually easy to coordinate right um just like it's easy well in, i mean you know relative to other things it's easy for russia america and china to coordinate a nuclear non-proliferation regime which has been relatively successful right i mean you know there are not that many countries with nuclear weapons and most of the ones that do have nuclear weapons are basically vassal states to America or vassal states to China and Russia, right? There really aren't any nuclear rogue states anymore, right? I mean, I'm going to count North Korea as a Chinese vassal state. Uh, I'm going to count Britain and France as U.S. vassal states. Um, you know, there really isn't that much, right? So I actually don't think the international cooperation thing is that difficult. Um, I think it re will require a lot of work. Um, I think, you know, it's not going to happen automatically. We have to realize that this is a problem, um, but it's not that hard. If the technical people have a technical answer that they can tell to politicians and they can say, look, we need to do this, otherwise it's going to kill us all and nobody's going to get anything. Then I think the game theory, the international game theory, isn't that hard, right? I think it's more of a problem if the technical people throw up their hands and say alignment is impossible, uh, you know, be because you see, if you start saying a good outcome is impossible, then, you know, decision makers will not believe you that a good outcome is impossible. They'll just go and listen to somebody else who has a different story about how to achieve a good outcome, right? Um, so if you say alignment is impossible, uh, they'll listen to somebody else who'll say, no, 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 it is possible, you just have to do my thing, and my thing will work. And then their thing is kind of dumb, and it doesn't work, and it actually does result in an unaligned or misaligned superintelligence, and then it does kill everyone. But so, so, so I'm kind of bearish on this kind of like alignment is impossible, you know, throwing up your hands, I'm kind of bearish on, on Yudkowsky's stance of like saying he's given up. Um, you know, for precisely these reasons, because decision, you know, I've given up, it's impossible is not an answer that decision makers will accept. They will go find somebody else, basically. Um, now that this, I mean, does, do you, do you want to come back against me on, on the international point? Uh, yes, I mean, I think I think I cardinally disagree with you there, um, simply because uh, uh state power doesn't scale with the amount of nukes uh, you have. I mean, it does, but at the end of the day, uh, the point of, uh, of a nuclear arsenal is to have a credible, survivable deterrent in the event that the other guy nukes you. Uh, and um, uh, like whether you have uh, a, a hundred nukes, whether 
like it's preferable from like a lower power perspective to have a thousand nukes and even better to have ten thousand. But it's not really like it's like that cardinal of a difference at the end of the day. Uh, whereas with uh, uh, with uh, AG with uh, with AI. Uh, the um, capabilities you have scale uh, very like smoothly with the uh, and exp uh, in in fact uh, hyperbolically with the uh, uh, capacity of of uh, the uh, AI that you have at, at your disposal. As that's the first thing, and uh, the second thing is that it's um, uh, it's more difficult to identify the criteria by which you sort of start doing the the controlling thing. Uh, because with uh, with nukes you can have uh, you you have identified silos you have uh, like the factories which produce plutonium uranium in, in the enrichment facilities you can ex inspect them all and uh, this uh, this sort of like inspection regime like how would you even go about with an inspection regime uh, for uh, for like the various institutions within uh, within the U.S. and China, say, uh, which are going to be working on on uh, machine super intelligence, uh, it's just uh, like a cardinally more difficult problem. Uh, the incentives to have a more capable AI are vastly yeah, greater okay, and to have I mean, tons tons of, yeah. of nukes, and well, it's more I mean, difficult to count it and quantify it. Yeah, so so there are incentives to have more powerful AI systems because they can help with your economy, they can help with your military more importantly and you know the game the game theory of nuclear weapons turns into mutually assured destruction specifically because attack is easier than defense right so you know and 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 specifically because second strike is possible right um you know you know when somebody's attacked you you have the ability to do second strikes because of road mobile icbms in in russia because of slbms etc so you know Attack, you, you can't defend against nukes because of uh, MIRVs and decoys and stuff like that, because the, the, you know, the, the way that nuclear defense scales is bad compared to nuclear attack, right? Once you can build nukes, you can build a lot of warheads, you can build a lot of decoys, and you have a massive advantage as the attacker because you only need 10% of your nukes to get through to just wipe them out if you have, say, a thousand nukes, right? Or, you know, a couple of thousand warheads. Um, so the, the game theory of nuclear war does favor peace, which is a good thing, right? Uh, it's possible that the game theory of AGI or ASI or whatever, well, I mean, ASI is super intelligence. It's not really the humans in charge, but certainly of, of kind of like weekly, uh, you know, weekly sort of um, better than human systems that are scaling. You know, the game theory of that might be that actually not only can you defend against the opponent's attempts to attack you, but, you know, this, the technology is inherently dual use. And so if you're building a smart AI system to assist your intelligence agencies and your military, it can assist in shaping the world to defeat your opponent just as much as it can to defend your own population. So, you know, there may be a game theory problem there. Um, but again, I don't think it's insurmountable because, you know, if if there is... If you are going to get into a game where the Nash equilibrium is going to be that everyone goes and attacks each other, if you can see that that's going to happen, you can decide to stop it before it gets to that stage. Now, the question is, can you actually stop this? Can you actually um, impose restrictions on AI systems that either make them not you know, not so strategically overwhelming or that they can be strategically overwhelming, but they have some kind of alignment. So, you know, an alignment could be that you have a Chinese AI that's more intelligent and more capable than all of the uh, humans in, in China and than all the humans in America by, you know, a factor of 10,000, right? But it has some kind of alignment that it's not allowed to come up with plans that would you know, result in the destruction of America, you know, it has to, part of its alignment is that it has to maintain, uh, you know, some kind of equilibrium. And the American one has the same thing that it's, you know, it's much more, it's much more intelligent than everyone in China. It's much more intelligent than everyone in America. It's much more capable, but it has some kind of alignment, has some kind of restriction where it's not allowed to use that intelligence to try and destroy China. So, um, you know, if you can solve alignment, 
you can solve the geopolitical problem, right? Because I just told you how, you, you know, that everyone sits down and makes a decision together that they will enforce this condition on their super intelligent or extremely um, above human intelligent systems that they're not allowed to use them to try and kill each other off, right? Because obviously you would want to do that. That is a deal that you would want to make, right? Um, so I don't think the geopolitical angle is um, enough to make the situation hopeless, right? I think it does add a layer of complexity in that then the main complexity, I think, is you have to convince the people in China that we're not bullshitting them, right? That's the biggest problem that, you know, you go to China with this proposal and you say, look, or to Russia as well, right? You go to Putin, you say, look, we're going into the, you know, super intelligence age. We need to impose some conditions on each other's AI systems that they're not going to be used to basically kill each other off, that they're not going to be used to defeat each other strategically, that instead they're going to, you know, enforce a strategic stalemate. They're going to carve the world up into slices and they're not going to try and influence stuff that's happening in somebody else's slice, right? So it's basically going to sort of solve international relations in the sense that these AIs are going to be like, look, that's the Chinese side. We're not going to try and mess with that. Um, and, you know, if we, t if we say that to China and Russia, the, the big risk is that they think, oh, this is the West trying to fool us and trying to put restrictions on our AIs. And then they're going to fake that they have restrictions on their AIs, but they're not really going to. So, you know, there is like a technical problem there of both convincing people that it's possible and actually, you know, doing the alignment work so that this is, this is a technical option, right? Because if your only option is unaligned AIs, then yes, you do have a geopolitical bad Nash equilibrium. But then again, you also have the problem that it's going to turn us all into paperclips anyway. So, you know, I don't think that the geopolitical dimension adds that much difficulty in the sense that if you've already solved alignment, it doesn't add much more difficulty. And if you already haven't solved alignment, you're dead anyway, so it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, yeah, I, uh, to some extent, I, I agree with this. Uh, those are valid points. Of course, um, uh, I would say that the having two problems is uh, is um, like it sort of like doubles the problem. Uh, the problem die first of all, uh, you not only have to uh, solve the alignment problem with respect to the AI, AI becoming rogue, but also to impose some additional position um, uh, conditions and also make it uh, make them mutually verifiable. Uh, like like you can have uh, with with uh, with the nuclear uh, right. but, but arms the control is, regime, it, yeah. Yeah, it would have uh, but, to be uh, my, my way, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, in yeah. order to solve alignment, you have to be able to verify it. So it's not really an additional constraint. The additional constraint is the political side of convincing people in these, you know, hostile bureaucracies in China and Russia that we're really being honest with them and that we're not trying to basically scam them. Yeah, uh, I mean, but uh, as long as alignment uh, uh, remains unsolved, I mean, I think the bigger issue actually is um, uh, coming to this agreement that everybody uh, like like um, agrees to not develop AGI further from this point. Uh, right, uh, because uh, like uh, once you already develop it and solve the alignment problem, then the, and the, if, if it's a reliable, so like rigorous solution to the alignment problem, then yes, you can then coordinate it, like set up verification mechanisms um, on chain, perhaps. Uh, uh, but um, if you uh, uh, like uh, uh, with the position we're in now, uh, there's different companies which have commercial incentives to develop artificial intelligence, uh, like capable uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, nation states have have uh, strong incentives to do that. And the question, and so long as uh, alignment uh, remains unsolved, and in fact, so far as we know, it might not even be solvable in principle. And I do think that uh, that honesty is uh, like like better because I mean you, you you're sort of like proposing for uh, the um, uh, the uh, AI community to coordinate to uh, to sell to um, uh, like policymakers as a as a consolidated unit that alignment is possible whereas we don't really know well I mean 
since it's not really uh, something that, uh, like, how do you actually intend to force this uh, unity of opinion uh, so long as uh, that is no sort of like a well-established consensus on whether it's possible? Uh, that's just a practical problem you're facing right now. And that's associated with uh, with uh, how, with the related question of how do you how do you uh, contain those um, like uh, open AI and uh, the uh, deep mind and so forth from uh, from continuing to pursue uh, these the these things so long as alignment remains unsolved. Right. So I agree that that's a problem. Now I so so the the problem that I'm seeing here is there is a period where we don't really know how to do alignment that well. We certainly don't know how to verify that it worked, right? Uh, we, you know, if I wanted to prove to, you know, the Russian, uh, you know, government that the AI that I'm building is not going to do things that will result in the destruction of Russia, it's very hard to prove that because I could always just, you know, I build a very powerful model, right? Using, um, you know, like a, like a large language model and then I add some, bells and whistles onto it and then after i've done that you know maybe i add like a prompt or i do some reinforcement learning with human feedback or something like that which uh tries to align it but that that alignment step happens right at the end and it would be very easy to take the the model without the alignment and then just realign it just okay all of that stuff but now your goal really is to destroy russia you need to come up with plans that's gonna that are gonna you know result in the destruction of the russian state um now you know, so, so we can't solve that at the moment. But on the plus side, the AI systems we have at the moment are not that capable, right? So, you know, ov obviously when comparing AI systems to human systems, um, you have to be careful because intelligence isn't a scalar, right? So intelligence, so what, what makes this a little bit difficult is intelligence kind of is basically pretty close to being a scalar amongst humans, right? So we have IQ tests. There is some variance after you take into account somebody's IQ. Uh, this is how I cope with only having an IQ of like 125. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, like most of the information about a person is in their IQ, right? Um, whereas with AI systems, it's likely that the, the variation is much bigger um, so I think intelligence with AIs is, is more like a partial order than a scalar, right? So, you know, there is an iteration of system X can do everything that system Y can do plus more. So there is some kind of superiority relation, but most of these systems are just going to be incomparable, right? So, you know, you have system Z and system W and, you know, system Z is really good at something that system W can't do, and system W is really good at something else that system Z can't do, right? So anyway, with, with, with that caveat, it seems to me that the systems that we have right now are not capable enough to be really dangerous, right? And probably won't be capable enough to be really dangerous for at least five to ten years, right? Um, as in, they will not upset the geopolitical order in the next five to 10 years, right? And maybe, you know, 15 to 20 years, they actually will, right? Um, but as long as we're in this situation where the systems are not powerful enough to be super dangerous, it's okay to not have alignment solved yet. Now, I would call this, this the period we have now, I'd call it the happy place, right? The reason it's the happy place is because AI is strong enough that there is common knowledge pretty much amongst everybody and really, LLMs like GPT-3 and Sydney have created that common knowledge. There's common knowledge that superhuman intelligence is coming, but we're not there yet, right? And so this is a great period where we can work out how to do alignment. And I think what we should be doing is we should be extending the happy period for as long as possible, right? So there are things we could do to make this period last 40 years rather than five years, right? Or 30 years. Yeah, so so we get get China to invade Taiwan and uh, bomb the TSMC no, factories. TSMC yeah. isn't the problem. The problem is the next generation and the generation after that of chips, and the generation after that, and so on and so forth. Right. So the the problem is innovation in hardware, and th this is I think a point that I've made, but I haven't really heard anyone else make. 
Innovation in hardware is now negative utility for humanity, right? So we shouldn't be innovating in hardware. We should not be making chips that allow you know, us to build AI systems that are 10,000, 100,000, or a million times uh, more powerful than they are at the moment, right? Um, I notice we have a request. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take requests to speak um, towards the end, actually. Um, maybe in, say, 20 minutes' time. Um, so I, I think if we can prevent those innovations in hardware, and it's really not that hard to do, right? Because you asked earlier, well, there's no equivalent of, you know, uranium enrichment, but actually there is. You know, these, like, companies like ASML, which produce the uh, machines to produce the next generation of hardware these can be shut down fairly easily and you know asml is actually unique in the whole world right there's only one that we need to shut down and you know china doesn't have it yet they're trying to copy it but they haven't really succeeded they can't make current gen chips um it wouldn't be that hard for us to limit hardware capabilities growth and stay in the happy place for a, a while longer right which means that we still see advances in the capabilities of AI systems because a lot of these advances are sort of baked in now, but the, the rate that those advances accrue at is decreased and it's more like an asymptote. It's more like, you know, it kind of like uh, decelerates rather than continuing to accelerate, right? So I think that's one thing we can do. That's one thing we can tell people is we need to decelerate on the hardware side at the same time as we scale up the alignment research side, which is still extremely small. There's only a, about 100 people working on alignment right now, which is incredible. <laughs> I uh, agree with you that there are bottlenecks, and uh, Doc's law, basically the uh, cost of uh, chip fabs doubles, like in line with the, uh, like with every doubling, uh, with, with every, every halving of, of, of like chips, you, get, you also get a... Uh, uh, there's that uh, uh, there's that thing where the price of chip fabs go goes up uh, every every few years, uh, and um, uh, ASML has a near monopoly. I mean, I think China has the economies of scale to replicate it, uh, uh, but uh, if you can get the West as a block and uh, and China on board, then yes, I'm I I agree with you that it's technically possible if you surmount the extremely formidable. Uh, challenge of uh, actually convincing policymakers, uh, uh, um, like in these uh, in these blocks, uh, to go along with your plans and to credibly commit to them as well, which is no less important. Uh, the main uh, sort of like questions I have is uh, are, like several like like three basic questions. Uh, first of all, where is the end point? Uh, I mean, we have to uh, bear in mind that there's a possibility that a decade passes and alignment isn't solved. 20 years pass and alignment isn't solved. Uh, 50 years pass and it still isn't solved. When are you going to put an end to it? To it? And uh, uh, could this uh, become sort of like a self-sustaining cult-like taboo against uh, against uh, like uh, further AGI development with time if, if this regime continues uh, long enough, as to some extent actually has happened with civilian applications of nuclear power uh, yeah. to the detriment of human welfare around the world, which is uh, uh, which is uh, w one thing I'd make I'd like to point out. And the other thing I want to to say is um uh your basic you know like this thing if, if you do it it would actually uh, materially decrease the quality of life that many people who live on this planet will will live uh, it will sort of push it will in all likelihood push back the point at which we uh, develop uh, a radical life extension if we ever do develop it without the help of agi uh like it will kill millions if not billions of people well relative to a world in which uh, radical life extension is developed uh, if it continues long enough, perhaps uh, just loading on human brain power is not enough for us to like uh, to like sustain industrial civilization indefinitely in light of uh, like the dysgenic uh, trends in intelligence that uh, prevail in, in much of the world. Uh, so how do you balance that against uh, against uh, this proposal of, of, of technological control? Well, you know, the, the first point, I think the answer is pretty easy. There's only 100 people working on alignment in the whole world, right? Um, and the field is growing 
relatively rapidly, but it's still a very small number of people. Um, you know, there are more people probably working on, uh, you know, like butterfly sex uh, than working on AI alignment, right? Um, I mean, I, I looked into this a while ago, um, and I had a thread about it, which I should highlight, um, where I was just sort of looking into how many physicists did it actually take to work out the mechanics of, say, a supernova, right? And there are still things that we don't know about the, the mechanics of a supernova. There's, there are still some unknowns, but we've mostly worked it out now. And it's like a lot, right? It's like thousands of people for many decades, right? Um, with tens of thousands of people in supporting fields, right? Um, so, you know, if we can work out how a supernova works with, you know, a thousand specialists for a decade and, you know, 10,000 uh, supporting people in, you know, mathematics and physics who are sort of supporting them, it seems reasonable that, you know, increasing the number of people working on alignment from like a hundred to a thousand and increasing the amount of time they have from like one or two years to like one or two decades is going to have a big impact. And it's really unreasonable to ask the alignment people to be done as soon as you realize that it's a problem. Because I feel like the way this field has progressed is back in the thousands, you know, the objection to AI alignment wasn't that it would slow progress down. The objection was that AI was impossible, right? So they would say things like, oh, you know, um, like the Chinese room thought experiment or some other random silly philosophy, like humans have souls and AI will never have a soul, so it can never really be intelligent. Like people just thought this was never going to happen, right? They thought that human level AI was, was philosophically impossible. Now we're at the stage where there's suddenly common knowledge that human level AI is possible because it's basically it's hitting us in the face by actually talking to us and writing poetry and stuff like that. And now people have immediately switched over to like, oh, we can't stop this. This is inevitable. There's no point working on alignment. You know, I really do feel that humanity needs to give alignment researchers more resources than it gave to people who study supernovae and more time, right? So it needs a couple of decades a couple of thousand people spread out across the world with another 10,000 or 20,000 who are supporting them um, in order for us to really say that we've even had a crack at the problem, right? Because if you just had a hundred people work on supernovae for one to two years, they wouldn't solve it, right? They just, it was just not enough, right? Um, so so I, I think there is a pretty clear case for actually working on the problem a little bit before we admit defeat. Um, I think we had, um, Ronnie Fernandez, uh, wanted to speak, but I, I allowed that. So if he wants to come on, go ahead. Anyway, Anatoly, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I certainly agree that uh, the uh, field is underfunded, uh, relative to what it should be, uh, by any sort of reasonable, uh, uh um, sort of like cost benefit analysis. And that, uh, like you, the field needs orders of magnitude um, more funding, given that it's sort of like an existential risk. I mean, certainly it would not be absurd to switch the amount of resources that something like uh, climate change research gets with with uh, uh, AI alignment research. Uh, that that seems to be a pretty pretty obvious and. Uh, uh, and uh, reasonable uh, trade-off. So it's not as if I'm against alignment per se, uh, but it's just that uh, I, I view that it's it's a hard problem, possibly impossible uh, um, in principle, uh, that um, uh, indefinitely uh, sort of like clamping down on it uh, carries its own risks. Uh, in which, in which, sort of like not just alignment, but uh, but uh, AGI in principle becomes impossible if the uh, civilizational, uh, like um, human capital foundation of it, uh, degrades to a uh, critical extent uh, during this happy period. This happy period ex extends sufficiently long, we just sort of like fall into a kind of drug-induced uh, uh, stupor. 
um, that's sort of a possibility. And uh, ultimately, for various reasons, which I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm sort of much more um, sort of like um, uh, uh, white pilled about the uh, uh, the likelihood of uh, of the AGI that does arise being uh, uh, being a, either a dominant singleton or the malevolent one, uh, because uh, well, I mean for the fundamental reason that. Uh, um, malevolence doesn't uh, isn't usually evolutionarily evolutionarily competitive, and uh, also that many agents are usually better at solving complex uh, problems in a single one. Uh, but uh, uh, ideologically rigid agents are very bad at adapting to dynamic and complex environments in principle. So uh, to the extent that any uh, like dominant AGI starts branching off agents to fulfill certain tasks more completely, those agents will develop their own values and interests and so forth and will ultimately uh, constrain the sort of like the parent uh, AGI in the, in the sort of like uh, crazy things it, could, it can potentially do. Uh, so I'm I'm just like in the, at the basal level a more white pilled about this, and I think that more uh, that, that some some measure of attention should really also be dev devoted to the very real risk that uh, uh, if this happy period is is extended for too long, it could sort of like become self-sustaining, uh, like a uh, like a um, uh, reach some kind of uh, you know like a local uh, pit that from which it it becomes impossible yeah, uh, yeah, to emerge yeah. for like another few centuries. So, so let me address the second point, the idea that advanced AI systems will spawn, uh, you know, child systems and those children will sort of um, develop their own values. And then those systems will restrain what the original system can do. So it can't do anything too crazy. The problem with this is that, the first superintelligence probably will d successfully develop a theory of alignment, right? And so the child systems that it spawns will be perfectly aligned with its goals. So if we build a paperclip maximizer, the paperclip maximizer will just build more paperclip maximizers, right? And that's the, that's the really big risk that, you know, there is an event, a sort of value freezing event where some agent manages to sort of really lock in its values and all subsequent agents have to basically, um, you know, have the same values, have the same utility function. And the worry is that that happens after we build a more powerful agent than us. And then that system does work out how to do alignment. And the reason it, it will work out how to do alignment is because of instrumental convergence, i.e., if you have an agent with a certain utility function, like maximizing paperclips, and it considers designs that it could use to build a successor agent or a child agent or a helper, it will see that the number of paperclips that get built is much less if its successor agent or its child agent or its helper agent doesn't have the same utility function as it does. So there is an, a very strong instrumental reason for these agents to actually themselves solve alignment. Even if we're stupid enough that we don't solve it, they won't be stupid enough that they won't solve it. And that is the real kicker here. Um, listen, we have uh, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Fernandez. Um, if you want to comment on this, go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to quickly ask Anatoly uh, two questions. So my first question is like, so you're saying you're relatively white-pilled on something like a, a singleton, whatever, takes over the world type scenario. Um, so my first question I want to ask you is like, you know, rough guesses. I don't expect you to like actually be consistent because it's really hard to be consistent. But like rough guesses, like what probabilities are you assigning to a scenario like that? And the second question is like, if you were like 10% on a scenario like that, like given that we get something uh, AGI-ish, uh, that we end up with a singleton that takes over the world. Like, would you, if you were ten percent on that, on that, given that we end up with an AGI, would you then be like more on board with Roko's plan, um, or like what probability would you need to be on? The, what conditional probability would you need to be assigning to like be on board with Roko's plan of uh, slowing progress down? Well, now that we've discussed it, I don't think uh, uh, our visions are actually that opposed after after discussion. Because fundamentally, I agree that uh, uh, that it uh, it does at least make sense to devote a uh, much 
vast uh, proportion of uh, of human brain power on uh, trying to solve the instrument the uh, the alignment problem and if uh, if um, like a much larger um, a proportion of the human new sphere uh, can't solve alignment, uh, then, well, we might actually then assume that it really is an extremely difficult problem and the uh, uh, chances that a, like a, that a bad AGI can appear in principle uh, and will will and will and actually solve the, uh, the alignment problem, unlike us, uh, should then be subsequently be reduced. Uh, so I don't really think that we're, we're on opposite sides. Um, I do think that uh, just because uh, a dive, uh, one of the basic dives of, of AI would probably, um, uh, like as per the original definition, does include acquisition, uh, then some sort of like grasping towards uh, singleton status will, will happen. Um, that's very plausible. Um, but um, I don't think that it's uh, if, if if the scenario in which there'll be a multiplicity of different AGIs and the agents uh, swimming around. Uh, uh, first of all, I don't think it's going to be it's going to be more of like a sort of like um, system of uh, overlapping spheres of influence, uh, not like some kind of dictatorial AGI sort sort of totally controlling the world. First of all, secondly, even if if that does happen, I don't think it's obvious that it's going to be a sort of like a brutal totalitarian and you know, our paperclip uh, maximizing insane uh, AGI because as, as I said it's not uh, it's not doesn't really, it's not a scenario that makes much sense and uh, probably something like as in the book sci-fi book Avogadro Core uh, in which this uh, AGI coexists with humanity essentially um, uh, in a in a relatively benign fashion uh, this sort of scenario makes more sense but if you have to like force me to assign to abilities at gunpoint. I mean, I'd say that uh, maybe 10% chance that an AGI could achieve something that's resembling sim that resembles singleton status, and the uh, uh, this the chance that uh, this will be a very malevolent uh, type of one, which uh, which involves uh, enslavement or. Um, or uh, annihilation would would be ten percent of that, so perhaps one percent in total. Cool. Uh, cool. So, what was the second question? Yeah, I think so. Like, if you were at ten percent on, so I, I think the framing of malevolent is interesting because I, I think Roko and I are not like uh, thinking that it's going to have particularly malevolent values. I think Roko and I are thinking like for. You know, if you if you picked a, a random set of values for an AGI, uh, like, you know, all but one out of a million times, it's going to end up having values that like instrumentally make it worth it for it to like quickly right. cease. So, so, so maybe, yeah. So maybe for the listenership, I should kind of go through this argument. So the the argument for AI being potentially very dangerous by default is a combination of fragility and complexity of value combined with instrumental convergence. So, you know, let's say, um, let's say you have a game like uh, Command and Conquer or one of these real-time strategy games, and um, you have a bunch of teams, right? And one of them's an AI, and you've programmed that AI that it has to, um, it has to like build some specific sequence of structures in the game, and it has to keep them safe. And that's all it has to do, right? Now, if this is a very powerful AI, uh, the, the kind of plan that it's going to come up with uh, to, to fulfill that goal is first beat every other faction, take all their resources, and then once you've done that, go and build the structure, right? Um, and the reason it will come up with that kind of plan is because that minimizes, um, assuming that it's much more powerful, of course, right? And assuming that it can't negotiate um, and, and even if it can negotiate, if it's much more powerful, it might still do that. So the, the reason it might come up with that sort of plan is, you know, I want to build, like, let's say you have to build the world LOL out of power plants in this real-time strategy game and put it on the map and then defend it, right? So, you, you know, you first just win the game, right? Uh, you destroy everyone else's stuff. Uh, you take all their resources, and then you go and build LOL out of power plants, and then that's it. Nobody else can damage it because they're all dead. Um and you have the maximum amount of resources because you took everyone else's resources, right? So that's sort of instrumental convergence. Um, and now, you know, fragility of values, um, you know, people have a lot of different values. 
Uh, a lot of different things we like. We like ice cream. We like socializing. Uh, we like people to have freedom. Uh, you know, we don't like people to, um, you know, commit suicide or join weird cults and stuff like that. Like we have all, all sorts of different values, right? right? And these values are sort of like uh, derived from uh, little optimization circuits in our brains that, you know, evolution managed to uh, accidentally uh, sort of program us with. And, you know, if you really think about it, they're quite unique, right? I mean, if you had to uh, look through the universe, imagine the universe is infinite. If you had to look through the universe and find an alien species that had exactly the same set of values as humans do, like, you know, they, they've invented something called ice cream and they like it. And, you know, they like having two eyes and um, they like having two ears and, you know, just a whole bunch of weird sort of um, quite specific things like that. You know, it's unlikely uh, that you would find another species unless you happen to just come upon some kind of pretty much identical uh, evolutionary path. Right now, there can, to some extent, be convergent evolution. But, um, you know, if you really sort of mapped out and, and the, part of the problem with inst with uh, fragility of values is we we don't really see we don't really see a lot of other examples of values that are really sort of alien and different, right? Uh, we just see our own. But I mean, you can see this to some extent by looking at other human civilizations, like, the, you know, Chinese uh, civilization seems to be like, at least some of them seems to be pretty okay with, uh, with eating pet, you know, pet cats and dogs, right? Well, not the pets, but just, you know, like get some dogs and like beat them, beat them to shit with, uh, <laughs> with, with batons and then like skin them alive and stuff, right? And we're not okay with that. We are okay with killing cows. That's okay. But it's not okay if it's a dog, right? I mean, that's actually quite a specific value, right? Um, and then you have like the Aztecs who had a fairly powerful empire which uh, conquered a lot of tribes around them, and they had human sacrifice all the fucking time, right? They they were nuts about human sacrifice. They they liked human sacrifice like we like McDonald's, right? Uh, which is messed up, right? Human sacrifice is horrific, right? It's an abomination. Um, but you know these Alex who are very close to us, they're the same species, right? They're they're humans. Um, perhaps you could say they're a different subspecies because they're like you know. Um, uh, sort of Native Americans, but I mean, they're very, very close to us and they come up with things that we think are just total abominations. Um, now, you know, if you think about what an AI would come up with, um, it could be anything, right? It could value anything. It could be, you know, imagine an AI that was derived from the value of spiders, right? So spiders become super intelligent uh, some, you know, by some miracle. What would their values be like? Right, and and people have written a lot about this um, because it's kind of a subtle point. But you know, if you sort of randomly pick out a set of values, a set, an, an axiology, it's probably not going to be the one that we have. Right? You know, we're very clear. We, you're not allowed to harm cats and dogs. You're not allowed to do human sacrifice. Um, you know, you, ice cream is good. Uh, human sacrifice is bad. There's just so much. That goes into our values there's so much complexity there that you know if you pick anything else it's going to be very different which means it's going to be an abomination so you know the vast majority of possible axiologies that an ai could have are probably going to be kind of abominations and even worse right instrumental convergence means that even if it's like something benign that we don't really care about like let's say you build an ai whose goal is to like turn the whole of the andromeda galaxy into ice cream right? Um, it's instrumental convergence is still going to make it say, oh, but first we kill all the humans and take all their resources. But why would it want to kill us if its goal is just to turn Andromeda into ice cream? Like, we're not, we're not in a rush to go to Andromeda right now. That's true, but we might in the future. And it doesn't value our lives at all, right? It places zero value on them. There is some non-zero probability that we would later on try to stop it from converting the Andromeda galaxy into ice cream. And so, you know, the rational plan for it to make is to just kill us all off so that that can't happen, right? Um, so, so this is kind of the problem, right? That's the, you know, fragility of values plus instrumental convergence. Uh, if you really believe those things, um, you know, they cause a huge problem where sort of superintelligent systems generically want to kill you, 
right? It's just generic, just all of them, right? Unless you unless you really engineer it really, 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 really specifically. And perhaps like another way to look at this is imagine I mean, when you were at school studying chemistry, you had maybe one of those uh, chemists uh, cupboards, right? Where they, you know, they had all the resources. They have magnesium, zinc, sulfuric acid, they have all these different chemicals, right? So if you go in there and you just like eat one tablespoon full of like a random chemistry ingredient, right? It's probably going to be bad for you and quite possibly will kill you, right? And, you know, why is it that so many chemical elements and compounds out there are all sort of in this conspiracy to be toxic to you? Well, it's just because the human body is sort of fragile, right? It sort of likes a very specific set of chemicals to be inside it. And if you just sort of randomly choose chemicals, acids, metals, stuff like that, you know, like a lot of them just do something that interferes with the normal functioning of your body. It's not a conspiracy. It's just that, like, you know, you have this complex system and, you know, putting like an unusual chemical into it is sort of like violence against it. It's like chaotic, right? And when you do chaos to a complex system, you break it, right? So, you know, the set of chemical compounds that are good for you to take, the set of medicines is really, 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 really small in the set of all possible chemical compounds. And the majority of all chemical compounds, if you take enough of them, will kill you, right? Um, and quite a lot of them, even if you don't take very much of them, will kill you. Um, so it's kind of like aligned AI is like medicine, unaligned AI is like, you know, copper sulfate solution, right? It does, you know, the copper sulfate solution doesn't love you, it doesn't hate you, but, you know, the, the copper atoms are going to do something to interfere with your metabolism and kill you. Yeah, uh, I want to just, like, quickly try to, like, uh, phrase this as a question to Anatoly. So, like, um, I guess, like, I think a lot of, like, the uh, cruxes or, like, like the main things that will change your mind about questions like this, uh, like, come down to what your beliefs about, like, the distribution of possible super intelligent minds is like. Um, so, like... I think Roko and I are pretty much on board that if you like took a randomly selected super intelligent mind out of like possible program space and you instantiated it on the planet, like almost always uh, it's going to end up killing all of us. Uh, whereas like, I think like the kind of like the default assumption is that like, if you take a randomly selected super intelligent mind, like, I don't know, maybe it's like a 50, 50 shot. Like I think the standard way to kind of partition the space is something like, it's like a good guy or it's a bad guy, probably like 50, 50. Uh, whereas Roko and I are like looking at like a different kind of partition, which is like, what's the specific set of values. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering Anatoly, like if you imagine taking a random, a random program that's super intelligent out of, uh, out of program space and instantiating it today, like what are the chances you think that like it would by default, for instrumental reasons, uh, like enter into a bunch of competitions with humans or like try to basically disempower us from uh, being able to affect the universe? Well, it seems to me that uh, you and Doko have a uh, sort of like a dark forest vision of, uh, of the super intelligent space of possible super intelligences. And uh, um, but basically, what we uh, what we can observe just um, uh, just the um, evolution on our planet, which is like the the only sample uh, we we do have access to, uh, is that uh, um, uh, again I'm, I, I I doubt that it's going to be a very very large number of super intelligences which are going to be in this sort of like a, a ideologically digit state because first of all it's uncompetitive and furthermore like across evolutionary history. Uh, that sort of uh, attitude seems to have been selected. So I'll give just two examples. Uh, one thing that more intelligent animals uh, seem to have in common is that they are more playful uh, or in general. So like dolphins are fa famously like playful with uh, with humans, octopuses, uh, for instance, uh, um, and uh, even, even elephants. Uh, like elephants are actually very uh, empathetic animals and they've got the biggest brain of, uh, of any animal. Uh, I mean, again, like they have to compare 
Leonards, they all they all love to to play to a much larger extent. Like even orcas. I mean, orcas they're pretty cruel, but uh, but they do have to eat. So um, otherwise, they're not like cruel just for the uh, for the for the sake of it. Uh, and even across uh, human civilizations, over time, you have the um, uh, like at some points you do have some value value systems which are very much at odds with the modern sensibilities, like you mentioned the Aztecs. Uh, but even then, I mean, uh, apologies for sounding like Steven Pinker. And uh, yeah, so oh, obviously you acknowledge that uh, like these mechanisms not necessarily have to work uh, uh, among, uh, amongst alien civilizations or uh, super intelligence uh, or machine super intelligences. But at least so far as uh, humans are concerned, they, you had those. But uh, but uh, in Eurasia, at any rate, the uh, technology increased to the extent that you had the spread of these uh, more universalistic axial age uh, religions which were much more humane and universalistic and uh, I mean if you're familiar with the work of uh, Peter Tuchin in uh, Alter Society the book uh, he argues that uh, the main uh, evolu evolutionary reason why those uh, these axial age religions evolved was because you had the appearance of mega empires and to keep them stable across the passage of dynasties uh, or even individual doulas uh, you had to have some kind of uh, common more much more humanistic um, uh, ideological framework in place to allow uh, like these very diverse peoples within that empire to uh, to cooperate with each other and not kill each other and so forth uh, so um, from the admittedly very limited sample space that that we do have access to uh, I don't uh, it, it does suggest that uh, that um, that doesn't seem to be much grounds to uh, consider that uh, uh, that your average uh, super intelligence that spawns on this planet would uh, would hate us for absolutely no reason. It would probably be curious about it. It would want to play with play with us. Uh, it might get very bored pretty quickly because we're at a very low intellectual relative uh, level relative to it. Uh, but um, I am like, what 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 reason would it have to to like wipe wipe us out? I mean, that's I mean, so not, not not something region... that's that's extremely obvious to me. Uh, but. Well, um, this... The, the reason yeah. is incremental convergence, right? So if you have, a, and let, let, me, let me just say, say this quickly, right? I mean, if you have a, a system that's trying to reach some goal, right? Like a goal-directed system, like, oh, my goal is to, uh, you know, make as many paper clips as possible, right? It is instrumentally rational to first kill everyone else so that they can't stop you, right? If, you're I mean, if you if you if you if you kill if you kill everyone else, uh, the problem is that uh, you might then go crazy because you have no other intelligences to calibrate you as against yourself, and you might actually be at the end of the day less effective about your goal of turning into uh, everything into paper clips. Uh, just well, simply I mean, because more digit possible. systems, they're, mean, they're less they're less competitive, less effective. Right. I mean, it's possible that there is some benefit to talking to humans and stuff. Although, I think if we're talking about a super intelligent system, it's actually pretty unlikely that humans would really be of much use to it, right? Um, maybe if it's not a super intelligence, maybe if it's only uh, slightly smarter than human, it could maybe keep like a sort of uh, a zoo of human philosophers, uh, you know, may hey, maybe you and me will make it into that zoo. I mean, God, I probably would, right? Uh, Eliezer probably would. Robin Hanson probably would. Um, but, you know, maybe it keeps a few people around and it just sort of like, you know, keeps us on ice and then sort of boots us up when it wants uh, an opinion about something. But I think once you go to, um, once you go to super intelligence, you know, the, the, the benefit of having a, a few humans to talk to about things probably rapidly diminishes towards zero um you know by assumption it's sort of super intelligent right i mean it's got the, a brain the size of, of a planet literally uh what could i possibly tell it that it doesn't already know um so you know the instrumental drive to have advice uh or information will probably be very weak compared to the instrumental drive to just sort of take everyone's atoms and get rid of potential competitors. And this is especially the case if we don't want the universe to be turned into paperclips, right? Because it's like, oh, these people have a reason to oppose me, right? It can understand, like, this is the problem. Oh, it'll be nice because it understands what we want. Well, maybe the fact that it understands that we don't want what it wants 
is a reason that it will not be nice, <laughs> right? It's another reason. But, but let me come back to the stuff about like, um, you know, whales and dolphins and stuff like that. Like, these are all, you know, biological evolved intelligences that have been selected to be social animals, right? Um, so they, they have a selection pressure to not aggress against each other all the time, right? If you had a pod of dolphins that spent all its time, you know, on infighting, uh, it would fail. And this, you know, for the same reason that if you had a tribe of humans who spent all their time infighting, it would, it would, they would be a failure as a whole. So, you know, elephants, dolphins, humans, it's all really actually the same data point. It's not, that's not like a diverse, that's not a truly diverse collection of minds, right? That's, that's stuff that's really close to humans in terms of its brain design, because we're all mammals, and then also in terms of the fact that we're all social animals. So I don't think this is really supporting evidence. And the stuff about like axial age civilizations evolved to be um, evolved to be more humane because they had to, uh, you know, reduce uh, rivalry. I mean, again, I I think this is not this is not supporting evidence. This is actually countervailing evidence because it's, what it's telling you is it's telling you that when you have these kind of cooperative values. They generally come from an evolutionary history that's selected for them. But, you know, if somebody just boots up, you know, some AI at DeepMind and tells it to go and make as many paperclips as it can, it just didn't go through that, you know, selection, right? It never did that. So, of course, it would be that it would have no reason. There would be no physical reason for it to have developed those kind of drives. So I think we wanted, uh, Ronnie wanted to make a point. Go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, I guess I wanted to ask you a, a similar question to the question that I was asking before, uh, but frame it slightly differently. So like, suppose that you changed your mind about this claim about like the distribution where uh, you, you found out that like actually something like what Roko and I is saying is closer to true. Uh, something like if you pick a random super intelligent mind and instantiate it in the physical world, 99.9999% of the time it's going to have some like random ass set of values like making paper clips or like turning the Andromeda galaxy into ice cream um, would you then like change your mind about how risky it is to or like how, what, what else would you change your mind about then uh, like I'm wondering basically if this is like a crux for you if this is something that like uh, it's like a pillar it's like you know a load bearing part of your beliefs uh, well, I mean, if uh, hypothetically something like that happens, although I don't, uh, I mean, you have to think in pretty, no, no, pretty no, solid sorry. evidence. I'm not asking about, like, yeah, if something actually yeah. happens. I'm asking, like, yeah. you know, like right now it seems like you're like... Yeah, if if if, if, if I update my belief uh, to this, like, really bad outcome being not 1%, but as you say, 999 Sorry, I, I'm not talking about... Uh, dot, dot, dot 9%. That, yeah, okay. I'm talking about, like, so, like, imagine there's, like, a space of all of the super intelligent programs that are possible, right? It's infinite. But, like, I don't know, it's, like, a giant list of python programs or whatever and it's like this one is super intelligent that one's super intelligent that one's super intelligent roko and i are saying like if you ran down this list of python programs uh most of them would have random ass values that like have nothing to do with humans or nothing to do with dolphins or elephants most of them would be like you know this one wants to draw a giant penis on mercury this one wants to like you know turn the left half of the universe into ice cream and the right half into coca-cola cans and, like, even these aren't random enough, actually. Like, it's going to be even randomer stuff than that that, like, doesn't even map well to human concepts. Um, so Roka and I are saying, like, if you run through all of these programs, almost all of them are going to have random mass values. And then, like, some very tiny, tiny fraction of them are going to have values that are, like, compatible with keeping humans around. Um, and then an even tinier fraction of that are going to have values that are, like, yeah, I'd be really happy if this thing was instantiated. Um, and then there's like this other view, which I think is something like the view that you currently have, which is like if you ran through all of these programs, like about half of them would be like pretty chill to have around or something. Um, and and maybe, maybe maybe I'm like not actually capturing your view well when I put it that way. But I, I'm like specifically asking like if you imagine that there's this distribution of all possible super intelligent programs, and it turns out that like you know something like the distribution Roko and I are saying it, it is it turns out to be the real one where it's like almost all of the time you pick a random one, um, you're fucked. Like, 
mind you, this doesn't mean that actually, like, you know, when people are making an AI, they're not picking a random super intelligent program. They're going to be doing something to, like, try to make it a super intelligent program that does something that they like. Uh, but, like, I'm specifically just curious, it, right now at least, about, like, if you imagine that it's true, that if you pick a random super intelligent program out of all possible random super intelligent programs, um, that almost all the time you end up with random ass values, uh, like what else would change your mind? What, what, what else would that change your mind about? Okay, if the distribution is like that, uh, but more importantly, that they're, the, um, that, uh, they're equally likely to emerge, uh, then obviously I will go uh, put Larry in jihad mode uh, because that seems to be like the logical way and probably start, start trying to think of ways uh, of uh, how to make this sort of technological uh, anti-AI regime uh, like permanent and stable, like like in Warhammer 40k or whatever. Yes, uh, that would seem to be the reasonable uh, reaction to to such a thing. Although even in this case, I have to ask: Is this distribution, uh, this theoretical, is it, it like I I can actually imagine that the, the list of theoretical um, uh, programs that that generate uh, um, uh, these super intelligences actually do look something like that. That's very plausible. Uh, but um, you know, like just in the same way that uh, you can have uh, like different configurations of atoms, uh, like this, that describe different universes. Uh, uh, like if you subscribe to Tagmark's view that that the universe is a mathematical construct, uh, but uh, obviously some universes are vastly likelier to emerge than others, and I would assume that some super intelligences, some some forms of super classes of super intelligence are vastly likely to, likelier to emerge to emerge than others, and that in, in my view is the far more germane question. Yeah, yeah. right. So so the question is this process that generates super intelligences you know does it generate ones that are the, the the nice friendly ones or does it actually generate ones that are sort of you know bad generically now that's a little bit harder to answer and i don't think you know i don't think it's i don't think i have a convincing answer to that either way but there's certainly a risk that when you generate uh, you know, you go through some process, you don't really do any alignment work, you just kind of like do whatever you can to make it work and generate one of these things. Um, I, I, I'm very worried that the result of that will generically be bad and it'll be basically, you know, a hundred percent probability that it kills us all if there's no effort at alignment. Now, probably the companies that are doing this stuff right now are going to make some effort at alignment. Like they have, you know, with LLMs, they're doing reinforcement learning with human feedback, RLHF. Um, and then there's the question like, well, if you put some effort into alignment, do you get mostly happy, friendly AIs that we would like? Or is there some kind of dynamic where actually you don't necessarily get what you wanted? Uh, and that is that is the billion dollar question. That is the trillion dollar question. That is the quadrillion dollar question, which is why people are doing alignment research because they don't know. And the fact that we don't know is itself dangerous. It's like, you know, when people detonated the first atomic bomb, somebody got worried that they would actually ignite the atmosphere, right? And it turns out that it wouldn't right? But they were worried about it, right? And, you know, when they um, detonated the nuke at Castle Bravo, uh, they thought it would have a relatively small yield, and there was a side reaction that they didn't realize, a side a nuclear reaction that they didn't realize was going to happen, and the yield was, like, you know, five times higher than it should have been, and, you know, a bunch of Japanese fishermen got a lethal dose of radiation. Um... You know, it's a good job that in the development of nuclear weapons, the only significant mistake that they made was Castle Bravo. It's a good job that, you know, the atmosphere igniting wasn't the mistake, right? So is AI alignment going to be more like Castle Bravo, where, you know, you get most of it right, and then there's like this one side reaction that you didn't think of? Or is it going to be more like the atmosphere igniting uh, during the Trinity test? 
I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. And that is why we need to do alignment work. That's why we need to actually find out what these systems, you know, we, we, we have, we're so ignorant about this right now. We have no insight into how this is going to play out. And that, that's the problem. So I, I want to quickly say that I slightly disagree with Roko on this one. Uh, I think we do have some insight or like, at least like if we're looking at current paradigms for how to make powerful, like the most, the state of the art systems that we currently have, I'm like, man, basically we're just conditioning on the set of programs that like minimize some like really uh, simply defined function. And I'm like, yep, this looks like a really bad way to, pick programs or something like like i don't know if we're we're being let, let's be really generous and be like or generous on my view anyway we're and we'll be like okay one out of a million super intelligent programs let's say are like programs that would be consistent with like uh with like keeping humans around or like with a world where like humans are like not totally fucked um and i'm like okay so then to bring it up to a 50 50 chance we need to do stuff that like we need to find the program in such a way that it's like a million times more likely that we find a program that we like than a program that we don't in order to have like a 50 50 shot. And I'm like, man, that just really doesn't seem possible within the current paradigm. Uh, a million to one, like likelihood ratio is like really strong. Maybe yeah, nobody but knows. Let me, but let, let me argue against that, right? When you do RLHF, you put in more than 30 bits into it in, in, the, in the feedback, right? So there's enough bits there. If it's one in a million, I mean, there's, you know, yeah, it's not one in a million. It's probably more like one in 10 to the, you know, 500 or something. But, you know, there's, there's more 1500 bits of feedback in the RLHF that they're doing. Right. So I don't necessarily think that information theory means we're totally fucked. But I think the problem is we don't understand the dynamics. We don't understand whether these systems will be attracted towards aligning themselves or misaligning themselves. And, and 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 that that's a question I can't answer. Yeah, that's that seems pretty legit. Um... I, like like you know it. We know that at some point the system is going to know what we want, right? But the, the issue is the order of of execution of whether it becomes, you know, does it become aware of what we want at the stage where it still wants to want what we want. Or does it first want its own thing and then later on become aware that that is not what we want? And it's very important <laughs> which which order that happens in. Because if it's the latter, you get instrumental convergence and it kills us all, right? If it's the former, then maybe it actually becomes self, like self-domesticating, like self right? Yeah, I, I guess I, I want to say, like, Anatoly, if... If it had, if we had been in the world where like uh, the way that we make uh, state of the art AI systems was something like we we use evolutionary algorithms that involve them like interacting with each other and uh, like having a real big environment in which they like have to do things like negotiations with each other or whatever. If we had been in the world where that worked and wasn't ridiculously computationally expensive uh, compared to like stochastic gradient descent. Like, I think I might be a bit happier and, like, the, the arguments from, like, dolphins and monkeys would work better. Um, but, it, unfortunately, the world that we're in is, like, we have this totally different learning algorithm uh, and it just, like, doesn't involve interactions between multiple agents at all. Uh, and in that case, I feel much more worried or something. Right. But I mean, even if the even if we got super intelligent dolphins, you know, just because dolphins are cute, like doesn't necessarily mean that super intelligent dolphins would keep us around like they they might, you know, decide that we're like a pet fish and they like, you know, throw us around like they do with puffer fish uh, and basically use us as like prey. Like, you know, there's there's like a lot of, you know, I think almost as you get closer and closer to human values, it actually kind of gets more dangerous because the risk that they'll keep us around to torture us gets higher. Whereas like the paperclip maximizer probably just kills us. Um, you know, whereas like the super intelligent dolphins might do to us what like certain Chinese cultures do to dogs, right? Just, you know, or what we do to, to farm animals, right? Um, 
So, so it's, it's a tough problem, right? Um, and, and even if you had, you know, this like history of negotiation and uh, dealing with other agents, I'm not entirely sure that that makes things better rather than worse, because maybe they would basically be learning how to screw people over, right? Learning how to lie, deceive, uh, cheat people, etc., because that's, um, that's more optimal than, than cooperation, right? Um, if you can get away with it. So... The, the the whole thing is just covered in this. It's shrouded in this uh, this mist of of ignorance, where we we just we just don't know. The space is huge. Um, the 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 mechanism and the dynamics of what will happen when we build significantly smarter than human systems is mysterious to us. Um, you know, it's kind of like driving around uh, at night with the headlights off in the fog. Um, and that's all I'm saying. All I'm really saying is that this is where we should be especially interested in gaining more information, uh, doing alignment research. You know, there are probably things you can do right now with the current systems that will start answering some of these questions, right? But, you know, you need to have a team of qualified people. You need to have like, you know, $5 million to train one of these things, Um you need you need all of this shit, and by default, nobody's going to pay for all that because they're just going to want better performance, right? Um, because alignment at this stage, alignment research is science, right? It's not engineering, right? And the engineering stuff will lead to payoffs for companies that do it, whereas the alignment research, all that leads to is more information about alignment. And we need that information about alignment, but it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay out, right? Information about alignment is never going to pay out, right? The the payout is we is at, at some point we just we just don't all die, right? Uh, and and that that kind of worries me. Well, I mean, I think we have come to a commonality that uh, there's, uh, despite some um, uh, like differences in views, uh, well, views and emphasis, we do agree that uh, alignment needs to have many orders of uh, uh, orders of magnitude more funding devoted to it, at least on par with uh, what climate, say, climate science get gets, and in terms of the uh, computational resources uh, that that climate science gets, for that matter, which is uh, which is not exactly trivial. And uh, uh, for for uh, I would also say that I mean my sort of like dream world if I was um, uh, like a world dictator or whatever I mean I would go all out by singularity I would uh, uh, like start uh, like a lot of research programs based on um, genomic uh, IQ augmentation and radical life extension and perhaps even animal uplift uh, before I get uh, I get to to like the like machine in, the serious machine intelligence stuff uh, simply because uh, well I mean a sort of like a more a sturdy uh, biological uh, new sphere would be able to better understand and interact with any uh, with any machine super intelligence that does end up getting developed eventually so I mean I'd certainly uh, sort of like um, do the emphasis towards uh, towards launching by singularity but I'm not a world dictator I'm just some, uh, just some loser on the internet, right? Uh, so, um, um, so that's sort of like a pretty irrelevant uh, point because I don't, I don't, I don't I'm, not, I'm not getting to determine yeah. anything. The, and, the, the, the sorts, the sorts of, and the sorts of people who who are determining these kinds of uh, like uh, um, uh, priorities and so forth, uh, they don't exactly inspire confidence for uh, various reasons. Uh, so it is what it is. Yeah, Anatoly, the correct term is philosopher, not not loser. Just uh, make sure you get it, get that right. Um, <laughs> I've, I'm just some philosopher on the internet. Um, listen, we Ronnie Fernandez had to go. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to request. I see Michael has requested. Uh, Michael, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Well, uh, first, I wanted to say, you know, thanks for putting this together. I, I I've seen your comments like in a million different threads, <laughs> so. Uh, so it's it's always interesting uh, to hear your point of view. Um, I guess I guess one of my questions is, you know, as far as um, like like my worldview is, I, I think I think we a lot of our ego, like personal ego, and this applies to everybody, thinks that we're a lot more intelligent than we actually are. And you know, understanding like super intelligence, most of like, you're going to have 25 percent when you use the word super intelligence. 
think of Terminator, then you're going to have 25% think of like large servers. And then, you know, everybody has their different kind of view on it, but it's just because we can't even fathom like, like what even that would look like. Right. In my thought, I would think like, you know, in a good scenario, if super intelligence would just not care about us, we wouldn't even be able to understand it. Right. I mean, it could already be super intelligent and we don't even know. Like it's, it's, I'm kind of thinking like on more of that, like, like that reach on it. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, you mentioned something earlier in the, in the, uh, in the meeting and uh, you said you were looking at like five to 10 years out, but is that, um, is that basing innovation off of humans without AI tools in their productivity, in their jobs, in their companies. Like, because in my sense, it's like, okay, if you put super boosters on everybody who's working and you give them these tools, wouldn't the rate of innovation towards that end goal be, or whatever goal that we're working towards be a lot quicker? So I guess that would be my direct question to you. Right, so wouldn't, wouldn't it be quicker? Well, it's, it's hard to predict these things, but I mean, there are some things we can go on, right? So one of those things is hardware. Um, it's easy to reason about hardware and look at the number of, for example, the number of uh, synapses in a typical human brain, and then look at the total number of synapses in all of the human brains in the entire human race, right? And when the number of parameters in a machine learning model exceeds that number, it's probably super intelligent or it's getting, it's getting close, right? If it exceeds it by a lot, it's probably super intelligent, right? Um, so the, you know, these, these models, like the large language models, like GPT chat and uh, Sydney and stuff like that, you know, they still have, fewer parameters than the human brain does by probably like about a factor of a hundred to a thousand. Um, so I, I think like the easiest way to predict timelines, that's the least kind of bullshitty and, and has the most empirical support for it is to just look at the development of hardware, look at the total number of parameters in AI models and look at the total number of parameters in a, the human brain, and B, all human brains on, on the whole planet, that's what pushes me towards thinking that we're still a ways out, basically. right? We still have at least five to ten years, probably 15 years before we have you know, systems that are quite a lot smarter than a single human. And we probably have, you know, let's say, 20 years before, at least 20 years before, we're going to have systems that are smarter than the, the combined intelligence of all of humanity, but that's still not very long, right? You know, that's uh, you know, tw twenty years from now, I'm going to be you know still younger than sixty, right? So I'm still going to be around then, and we're probably knocking on the door of super intelligence at that point, right? Yeah, I think um, I, 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 you know, it's easy, it's easy to. Um, first of all, great point, uh, that actually I hadn't, I hadn't directly thought of it that way. And, and that actually, uh, opened up like a different part in my mind. And I, I appreciate your insight on that. Um, well, it, I mean, I have to be, I have to be yeah. honest. It's, it's right. Yeah. Right? It's not mine. It's, it's right. right. But just in, just in general, I mean, that's why we have these groups, right? Like we're, 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 we want to, uh, expand, um, you know, our understanding and, and, in every part. And, uh, I, I, I always appreciate anytime anybody shares info with me. Um, I, I guess, I guess the, I guess like the one, the biggest thing is, you know, I, I still kind of am, am stuck on like the understanding whether it's super intelligent or not. Um, because like at that case, you know, like we still need to be able to process the information and, you know, if we can't directly see it or comprehend it in, a, in our view, then, then it's hard for us to even know. So I feel like we'll have to, you know, 
develop our own technology just to see, just to be able to read a lot of this information, um, which I guess kind of goes to, you know, like expanding our own neural networks, right? Like that would be like... Um, well, I mean, there are some things where it's easier to verify than to generate, right? So y you could say to this thing, I want you to um, solve all of the Millennium mathematics problems, right? I want you to prove whether or not P equals NP. I want you to solve the, you know, Navier-Stokes equations. Um, you know, I want you to do, you know, all of that stuff, right? And if it gets all of that stuff right, that human mathematicians have been working on for, you know, many, many, many decades or centuries, and it can just do it all easily. And then if, you know, if it can, if it can perform at that level across a, a broad variety of subjects, um, then that's, that's super intelligence, right? If it's vastly more capable than all of humanity across all tasks, um, that would be super intelligence, right? By definition. Um, but certainly we can get something of a clue by just, you know, talking to these things and, and seeing how capable they are. You know, I've got a battery of questions that I've been asking to things like ChatGPT and, and I'm waiting for access to Sydney to, to the new Bing. Um, and it's, there are questions that are fairly easy that it can't answer correctly. Right. Um, so these things are definitely not super intelligent in my opinion. Right. And the, the hardware side backs that up because these things, these models still have fewer parameters than there are in the human brain by at least a factor of about a hundred. Um, so yeah, we're, we're not there yet. Well, that, that, um, I gotta, I gotta get go, get going, but, um, I appreciate, uh, uh, the, the people who spoke today and, uh, um, you know, thank you for, for allowing me to talk, but I hope everybody has a good day. Absolutely. Have a good day. And let's hope we don't all get turned into paperclips. <laughs> hey, you don't know, you don't know what paperclips life like. I mean, might not be that bad. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't want to be turned <laughs> What what is the new philosophical paper drops? Um, what's it like to be a paperclip? Yeah, I'll I'll submit that paper. See how see how many reactions <laughs> I get. What, what is it like to be a paperclip? <laughs> um, yeah, if anyone, thanks, Michael. If anyone else wants to um, raise uh, some points in favor of or against AI alignment, um, you know, feel free to request, uh, and I'll try to answer them. Um, if we don't have anyone else, I think myself and Anatoly will just wrap it up. Um, but yeah, if anyone else wants to, then feel free to request to be a speaker um, and uh, we'll do our best. Anatoly, any, any final remarks whilst we wait for people to do that? Uh, okay, alignment is important. I'm skeptical it can be done in principle. Uh, but uh, it's important to try and to vastly exceed uh, like the levels it's at uh, uh, currently. And if some of that even makes its way to me, I will not object to that. Um, however, uh, I think that um, uh, that uh, uh, so, so that's uh, that's the main thing. And I, I also think that it's very important to like develop biological intelligence as well. Uh, but uh, the the uh, at the end of the day, we we live in a society, uh, right? And uh, the um, uh, I'm pretty skeptical about the social institutions that uh, that they can uh, that, that they can um, um, sort of like mobilize uh, towards towards the end. And uh, I also have my skepticism even about the uh, like the people associated with alignment uh, uh, like around EA and uh, Miri and CFAR and so forth uh, to do this. But I'm not going to go into this because uh, you don't uh, don't think uh, drama is useful. Uh, so, um, like bearing this in mind, I think that, uh, some, like if, if, if you, if you can do it, which I don't think you can, but if you can e extend the happy period, uh, then I'm not in principle opposed to it. Uh, but, uh, you should bear in mind that, um, uh, there's a deal risk that it, uh, uh, that it turns into a self-sustaining, uh, cult-like structure. Uh, indefinitely, and that for every year that uh, the, this happy period uh, extends, that uh, uh, that um, uh, translates into a relative technological stagnation, relative to a world in which it doesn't exist, and that also translates into reduced welfare, uh, increased numbers yeah. of uh, premature deaths, and so forth. So it's ultimately, as with all things in life, a question of balancing. 
Yeah, so that that is an interesting point, and I think we forgot to really get to that, so maybe I'll say something about that. Um, you know, there is a risk, in my opinion, that AI alignment gets pushed too far the other way, and we get into the AI equivalent of the nuclear stagnation, right? So we have the technology and the brain power to make nuclear, civilian nuclear power work and basically make, you know, people said nuclear power is going to make energy so cheap that you don't even need to meter it. And I think, like, people make fun of that, but I think it's actually correct, right? Like, if we had continued to push nuclear power to its absolute limit in terms of capabilities, power might actually be too cheap to meter for domestic customers, right? Like, you know, the government would just give it away, right? It would be so, as long as, you know, you would have, like, a limited... uh amperage or limited wattage that your house could draw and if you just wanted to like have the lights on all the time or just have a heater on all the time the government just like would let you or they'd have be like some kind of service agreement where if you really started to take the piss they'd start metering it or something like that but for the kind of the kind of usage that people use today with you know kind of late stage nuclear fu nuclear fission technology not fusion fission it really would kind of be in the too cheap to meter sort of range where instead of paying like, you know, a hundred dollars a month for electricity, you'd be paying like $10 a month. Um, at which point, you know, you wouldn't care that much about metering it, that it would be, it, it, it really would be cheap. And, and not just the domestic electricity consumption, most of our energy consumption is not lighting and heating it's like transport embedded energy and food products stuff like that we would have a much more prosperous civilization if we had pushed nuclear power to its limits the problem is that at some point we lost our way with nuclear power right and it was it was sort of like once the um we had the three mile island problem in america um chernobyl kind of like cemented that china syndrome that kind of thing there was like a sort of there was actually a cultural turning point where the cultural pressure to be an environmentalist and to be an alarmist about nuclear power became greater than the cultural pressure to conquer the universe and be you know and expand and kind of like make the world better like like the kind of the virtue signals became more culturally powerful than the pro-civilization pro-progress people who were leading in the 1950s and i think it's very dangerous and it's a great risk that that could happen to ai um and, and as you say anatoly the problem is once it flips you know it's very hard to flip back right it's very hard to undo that kind of change um so i think we do need to tread carefully but one of one of the problems with being sort of anti alignment is the greatest reason that you can get this kind of flip is if you have some kind of disaster like chernobyl where things really do go quite badly wrong and if that's you know if that happens we might become too luddite right you're right now with we're too accelerationist, right? We need to actually slow down, especially on hardware, not on software, but on hardware, we need to slow down. Um, but if we did have like an AI Chernobyl, there is the risk that we would never get AI, you know, never get super intelligence. And that's a problem because I think without it, we probably are doomed for other reasons, right? There's a whole bunch of other stuff, dysgenics, bio risks, um, you know, civilizational collapse, all of these things are kind of happening. Uh, without AI, these things are actually going to bite, right? Um, so we actually need this technology. We just, we just need a little bit of time to figure out the alignment stuff in order for it to not become a cure that's worse than the disease. Anyway, listen, we have uh, Stefano, who's decided to come up. Uh, Stefano, welcome. Hi, hi, thanks. Uh, by the way, it's Stefano, <laughs> but uh, no, no problems. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I was thinking, um, let's say uh, we uh, we get alignment right, and uh, we get all the advantages of uh, of uh, an aligned AI. Um, how do you think the world would look like in, let's say, uh, two hundred years? Because either we 
kind of like sort of stop the um, the development of further and better hardware, but I think it's kind of like uh, um, unstable in a sense that someone would find a way to develop uh, even even better hardware. But then uh, the issue becomes like if then everyone gets the um, something like a sort of personal super intelligence in I don't know two hundred or two hundred and fifty years, like we have um, smartphones now um, compared to uh, what the PCs were um, I don't know uh, like uh, <clears throat> fifty years ago. Then it's kind of like feels like a bit uh, as if everyone would have a sort of like nuclear weapon in their um, in the pocket, and so because it's it's true we have to solve alignment, but we also have to find a way in which uh, the computational um, the computational resources that would then be uh, available to everyone are not used to produce an unaligned AI. So yes, sure, we have to solve alignment or then we have to, uh, to solve a sort of like social alignment because if, if just one of, uh, uh, of the personal super intelligence becomes a, a paperclip maximizer, then everyone is screwed. So um, yeah, but I mean, this, this, the advantage of having a super intelligence that's developed at say open AI or Microsoft or Google is you can just ask it how to solve questions like that. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, you can. I don't, I don't think we don't really. You know, one of the advantages of super intelligence is if you get it right, that you don't have to worry about anything else ever again. It's right? kind of like a Deus ex machina. So, uh, so. Yeah. yes, right. I mean, if you get it right, of course, is it possible to get it right? We don't know, but I don't think I'm not. I'm certainly not worried about what would happen in 200 years after if if we get a super intelligence, you know, at, at Microsoft or Google in the next 20 years, I don't think you have to worry what happens 180 years after that. You, you, what mm-hmm. you do have to worry about is whether that one is aligned and whether it's, you know, politically, um, whether the benefits are equally shared amongst everybody. So, you know, each person gets their own share, you know, in, in some sense mm-hmm. of the benefits of this technology. Um but yeah. yeah, probably the mental tools we're using to um, to assess uh, psychological and societal dynamics uh, uh, for the for the current years uh, won't be uh, applicable anymore once right. uh, once uh, AI is here. Yeah. So. And the other thing is, like, if you have a sort of large, and we already have this to some extent, right? We have uh intelligence agencies like the nsa where you have a whole bunch of very skilled very smart people whose job it is to make sure that individuals out there in society are not able to you know like do something like 9 11 right they're not allowed to crash a plane into a building and kill thousands of people so we you know we have we already have collective uh sort of human-based organizations whose job it is to keep us safe and you know they're not perfect but they do an okay job um i don't think that dynamic is at risk from super intelligence i think super intelligence actually pushes this a lot further towards centralization of power and that actually in itself is a risk because if you end up with let's say the woke super intelligence that wants to make everyone woke it will be impossible to resist it right um so yeah, I mean, that's that's actually, I think it's more of a problem that power will be centralized than that power won't be centralized enough. I see. Yeah, no, makes sense. Uh, well, that's I mean, also... I, that's I also mean, personally, nice. personally, I'm extremely skeptical of trying to project uh, what happens uh, once super intelligence comes online, because that is de facto, uh, for the most part, the end of human history. Not necessarily post-human history, but human history most likely um so uh, basically i think even many of the terms in which you describe politics and society will pretty rapidly um become defunct after that point 
uh, I can see and there's it's it's not difficult to envisage scenarios in which uh, basically the current uh, geopolitical structure based around nation states just simply dissolves and is replaced by uh, something out of um, like Balaji Srinivasan's vision of network states, for instance, in which uh, uh, people just uh, cluster into these uh, uh, like cloud or crypto based communities uh, uh, with uh, with like a mixture of uh, of AIs uh, and uh, and post humans uh, like belonging to various uh, communities, these online online communities and interacting uh, with with them uh, on uh, various layers, um, uh, like in the metaverse and other, other layers that we don't really know about yet, but which will will be developed. Uh, so I'm I'm just generally extremely skeptical about projecting either extreme dystopia or utopia uh, based on current conceptions, uh, as the gods uh, a a post human either. Yes, no, makes uh, makes completely sense. Uh, that's uh, yeah, it. Will I, be. I, Post everything. I, I, right. yeah. I mean, I, I actually think probably extreme utopia or extreme dystopia are probably the more the most likely outcomes, and an outcome that's something in the middle is unlikely, um, because you know once you have these powerful optimization processes, um, they're either going to be aligned, in which case you get utopia, or not, in which case. The vast majority of those scenarios are we're all dead, right, or worse. But you know, and let's 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 not bring the vibe down too much. But I mean, um, I don't think you get middle of the road scenarios with AI. You get very good or very bad. I don't think you get something in the middle. You can maybe get some something that's like good, very good on some axes and very bad on others, maybe. Um, you know, in some kind of like weird edge cases um, where it's sort of like almost perfectly aligned AI gets very smart and it forces people to um, to do things that they really don't want to do some of the time, but then most of the time everyone gets to do what they want. Um, you know, like maybe, maybe it's like the vegans get to control AI and you have to live one day of the week as a farm animal be, like for eternity. But people think that's kind of like worth it because you can just do whatever you want on the other six days and, um, you know, and it's great or something, something really weird like that. Um, but I, I don't think you get middle of the road outcomes. Oh, they might not appear middle of the road to us, but from the perspective of the entities that are going to be living uh, in there, uh, it's probably going to be. Uh, to actually seem to be middle on the road because, I mean, um, uh, as uh, Robin Hansen loves to point out, uh, uh, past eras can seem extremely uh, sort of like um, primitive and uh, barbarous to us from from the point of view of modern sensibilities and the age of M M era that he projects is uh, also uh, very, very weird. So, um, like, life yeah. costs a lot yeah. less in the age of M, for instance, but two yeah. Ems which have uh, been sort of Selected for to remove the fear of uh, of uh, liquidation, uh, once they're no longer economically competitive, uh, for them it will be no no big deal. Uh, so you know the past is a foreign country, and so will and so is the future by extension. Yeah, it's possible we get something like that. I mean, I think Robin Hansen is now sort of officially wrong about the age of M because you know, and this, this is just a little side side discussion on age of M. The, the whole thing that makes Age of M work is that AI is sort of so totally inscrutable that we never manage to work out a software method to get to uh, human-level intelligence. Uh, and then because there's no software method, you have to do the, like, you know, you freeze people's brains, you slice them up, you scan them, and then you emulate them. Um, but, but that's just not going to happen now, right? I mean, the large language models have just completely blown that out of the water you can get a model of a person just with a language model and then you condition it and they or you fine tune it on them right so we're not going to get age of m and that's a, a big an important difference and i did a little thread on this an important difference between age of m and language models is that in age of m you have to keep producing more M's, right? You have to produce more and more and more of them because each one can't be that intelligent because it's limited by the size of a human brain. 
you can't just make an M smarter and bigger and more intelligent. Whereas with these language models, you absolutely can, right? There's no limit to how much more you can train them, how much more data you can get, I mean, apart from availability, but you, certainly in terms of processing capacity, these things are more like the centralized um, sort of sci-fi AIs where there's like one, um, you know, like one AI that just sort of does everything and has insight into everything. So I think Robin's scenario is kind of dead, but it is an interesting scenario in that I think it's sort of internally consistent. If you did have this huge limitation that you couldn't make AIs much bigger or smarter than a human, you would get Age of M. But that assumption is violated and it's pretty clear now, so we will not get that. We will get, I think we will get something more like nuclear weapons where AIs are, um, they're sort of, um, they're owned by powerful companies and nation states. And, you know, it's more of a singular will right it has it's not like a bunch of small agents it's like one agent with a singular will and they'll go you know these companies or nation states will go to some effort to try and align them and then the question of whether we get a good future or a bad future is whether that alignment succeeds or not anyway guys feel free if anyone else wants to request uh feel free um otherwise i think we will have to wrap it up because it's it's been like two hours now Oh uh, well, yeah, just just a passing thought. I think that um, uh, that that there will be some degree of human alignment, regardless of how difficult it is. It is of everything is relative, and um, uh, the AI in question will also seek to align humans uh, and post humans, uh, and this entire process is called so, sort of social interaction, right? And uh, that's basically the most likely future uh, I see, uh, because uh, I don't I don't even see how you could realistically parcel out ownership of a of this sort of uh, putative, uh, uh, really advanced super intelligence. At at some point, uh, the uh, the very uh, definition becomes a bit absurd, uh, like like owning this sort of like demiurge, essentially. Um, uh, but uh, I don't think that the uh, my sort of like my prior, which 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 could be wrong, obviously, is that this uh, won't lead to any disaster, and that it will, for the most part, most likely be a relatively attractive uh, uh, future. So, at the end of the day, I'm uh, for 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 the time being, I'm pretty optimistic about all this. Great, we've got some uh, good vibes then. <laughs> We know that we know there are certain people who like the vibes-based reasoning, so um, got to keep the good vibe for them. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I think you know, I'm kind of old enough now to have spent a bit of time trying to predict the future. And you know, when you're trying to predict the future, the most intelligent thing to say is almost always, "I don't know." If somebody says, you know, "Will the future mostly be red or mostly be blue?" I don't know. Will AIs mostly be friendly or unfriendly? I don't know. Like usually i don't know is the right answer so i'm going to go with that um but given that we don't know given how high the stakes are i do think that we should be putting a lot more effort into questions of alignment and you know maybe there's something i can do about that um let's see so thanks very much everybody thanks for listening appreciate it anatoly and uh, yeah i i've got to wrap the space up now uh, if people want, you know, DM me. We can do another one of these at some point. Um, if anyone in particular is interested in debating um, AI risks, AI alignment, etc., I think this was worth doing, um, and I think we should do it again. So thanks, guys, and uh, I'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks for running this space. It was a pleasure.